All right, so let's do an intro. And by let's, I mean you. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to Everyday Eternal. And today we're going to talk about the top decks from Eternal Weekend, which was actually just a few weeks ago. We're going to talk about the results of Star City Games in Minneapolis, which was the same weekend. And then we're going to talk about decks and cards to attack the metagame and the metagame analysis for the upcoming GP at uh, New Jersey. So welcome back. And we're also going to remember to uh, introduce the other host. And with us today, with me today basically, is uh, Sam Craven. Hello. And no one else because they're all assholes and nobody, no. Uh, Everybody's away doing other stuff so it'll just be the two of us today. And it's ass o'clock in the morning. So, uh, Eternal Weekend. Uh, Watsy was nice enough to, on their not great website, they have a list of the top 32 decks. They're not in any order that I can determine, but it's still pretty cool to get the top 32 decks. I was actually surprised that they would put this up. I I mean, I was looking forward to going on the Eternal Weekend website itself, I think Titan Games or whatever, and looking it up on my own, but it turns out I can go to the Watsy website and find out all about Sultai Delver and Helmerator <laughs> and... Well, Jacob Van Luden tweeted the link and said it was a lot of people had asked for it. So, I mean, I guess that's good. I know Watsi says they usually don't like to put out too many deck lists because they don't want the formats to be solved too quickly. But uh, Well, th- considering there's, like, how many cards in Legacy? Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm not too worried about the format being solved. And if you're worried about the format being solved, then perhaps you should either print more cards for the format or unbanned cards to improve... The diversity of the strategy, but that's just me. I think that's another cast. But that's none of my... Kermit the Frog meme, but that's just none of my business. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of diversity. The top 32 features 16 decks. Uh, we've got... I'm just going to run through these real quick, and we can address the bigger points. Uh, seven Blue-Red Delver, four Deathblade, three Miracles, two Canadian Threshold, two Blue-White-Red Delver, two Ant, two Reanimator, two Death and Taxes, and one each of Blue-Black Tez, Punishing Maverick, Team America, Omnitel, Elves, Shardless Bug, Lands, and Pox. Uh, anything surprising in that result, Matt? Uh, there's a lot of twos. It looks like my sideboards. Like it's... <laughs> so there's a lot of twos. So, I mean, we were all predicting, or at least, I mean, we talked about it a little bit on the cast, that Blue-Red Delver is, is, has grown into its own now as a real deck. Now, I know Kobe's been playing it for a little while, and you saw a Star City finish quite a few months ago. But, I mean, 7 out of the top 32 is quite impressive, including the win. It's quite impressive. Well, and it's kind of morphed from Burn with Blue to, with the addition of Treasure Cruise, and with playing Young Pyromancer, it's become, well, it's become very similar to Blue Red Delver and Vintages, actually. But you're not so much a Burn deck as a Tempo deck. 100%. 100%. This is the tempo deck of the format right now, I would say. I mean, you ideally want to play turn one Delver into, you know, protection or young Pyromancer and just keep the pressure on. Uh, with the treasure cruises, you're just filling back up. You have a lot of free or near free spells. I think, I think though, sometimes the deck is a little too all in. For example, I mean, if you want to get anywhere with your Monastery Swift Spear, you need to have you need to either pump it beforehand or instant speed be doing things. So I feel like there could be more free spells in the deck. For example, I was testing with Gutshot, and Gutshot seems to be a real blow because people don't expect that card. Gutshot also seems really solid in that you're going to be expecting to play against a lot of blue-red Delver, and it hits all those one-toughness creatures for the low, low cost of zero mana. Yeah, and, I mean, mid-combat, you say have a 3-4, they block with whatever, and you just gut shot the creature. So it pumps your guy and, like, decreases theirs. That seems, that seems real good. I had asked if there were any surprises, and since you didn't mention any, I will. Uh, the big one to me is only one Elves, and we've been discussing Elves as one of the top two or three decks in the format for a month or two now. So only one showing of Elves is a little surprising. Uh, do you think that's just luck, not a lot of people brought it, or did one of the decks push it down well i mean let's look at the blue red delver deck sideboard i mean you have grim lava mancers and graft digger's cage that seems to be the only hate a lot of people seem to be playing graft digger's cage but otherwise i mean i don't uh i don't see what's what kind of happened i don't know the matchup between the blue red delver deck and the and the elves deck well enough that would be kind of a question for julian but i mean if the blue red deck is good enough 
then maybe maybe that's what happened. However, if people are trying to get rid of tokens, you know, there's going to be a lot more Golgari charms, zealous persecutions, engineered explosives. N not a uh, great time to be running uh, one toughness creatures in the format. Yeah, I think I think that could be a consequence of what's been happening. Which, which is interesting because uh, electricery. Wow. I had talked about in the past how I loved Young Pyromancer and couldn't play him because of all the splash damage from True Name Nemesis, and now it's almost the opposite. That we've got spot, we've got a uh, one toughness eight because of Young Pyromancer. Oh, for sure. I mean, this and deck has. Elves. I mean, this deck has a lot of weaknesses. I mean, the mana base is not particularly weak, so I think people, when you're playing against it, if you don't have a lot of experience, just remember it does not run Wasteland. However, it does run Price of Progress, so you just need to be careful. That's my, in my testing, that's the main thing that I kind of forgot about, is, you know, you're kind of playing around Wasteland, but that's actually not what you're playing around. You need to play around Price of Progress. I actually did want to talk about Zach Dobbin's uh, Helmerator list. Yeah, go for it. So, it's not Helmerator, it's Blue-Black Tesserator. So let's get that out of the way. Mind you, all the other names in this entire list are all screwed up anyway, like Sultai Delver and such. So, the Helmerator deck... Uh, a lot of the time, I actually did not play the Lee Line of the Void Helm of Obedience combo in the main deck. Why? You didn't really need to. It wasn't... You'd usually just play Jace the Mind Sculptor and a bunch of other stuff. However, I feel like with the rise of Treasure Cruise and graveyard-based strategies, Lee Line of the Void main deck is not a bad choice, and it's actually quite castable in this deck. So, if you guys aren't familiar with the list, I mean, we're going to post a link anyway. But the list is a, is a Soul Land based uh, mana base, so Ancient Tombs and City of Traders, along with, you know, most of the decks play either Chrome Moxen or Mox Diamond. This list doesn't, but instead plays six of the uh, of the Signets. So it plays Tal Talisman of Dominance, and it plays the Demir Signets. What are you actually trying to do with this deck? Well, you're trying to help, uh, combo off the Helm. You've also got uh, the Falcon Foundry Sword of the Meat combo, and you have Transmute Artifacts to basically go get your bullets. So Ensnaring Bridge is a good card, Thopter Founder is a good card, it has Trinisphere, and you have Lilana's White Main deck. And you have Baleful Strix as a speed bump to kind of take you there. Tezzeret Agent of Bolas or Tezzeret the Seeker are going to basically find your pieces and or let you combo off. Yeah, well, and I've actually been considering maybe running back my, uh, my Rip Helm Miracles list for the Grand Prix because, as we said, the Graveyard Hate is just so strong in the format right now. And uh, I put together like a two or three year old version of the deck uh, a couple weeks ago, and I played the uh, the Thopter Foundry combo in the main deck, and then almost every game switched out to Helm Rest in Peace because so many people would bring in Rest in Peace against you, just be oh Helm uh, I win. Oh for sure, I think Helm is really well positioned, especially if people are th if you think people are going to bring Rest in Peace in against you. However, getting back to this. Thopter Foundry is very good in that you can play out extra Chalice of the Voids, Signets, and whatever, and still create tokens, even if you do have, um, even if you do have a situation where you can't actually use the sword itself. I think it's still fine. As well, you create all these extra tokens, and you can just use Agent Abolus to do a mini, a mini Drain Life. You also get to, uh, severely underrated, I think, you get to gain life with Thopter Foundry. Oh, yes. And Very against good. a deck like Blue Red Delver, you may just run them out of gas. Oh, 100%. Another uh, another card that's really going to see a lot of play, or could see a lot of play, and Staring Bridge. And Staring Bridge is a really good card. Now you might think, like, oh, all those little tokens go under the bridge. Well, depends, right? If you're emptying your hand all the time. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, with, with very few instants, actually the only instants in the deck are four Force of Wills, it would not, it's not uh, unreasonable to think that after turn three or four, you'll just have an empty hand. Exactly. That's that's what I was going to say. We're, 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 we're right in line. And one yeah. thing I do find odd, I don't like only one helm uh, for a couple reasons. First, like, you know, they, if they counter it, if they destroy it, you're in trouble. But, um... Helm has an ability that isn't just win the game, and that ability is still pretty good. Oh yeah, you get to steal a creature. Like Now, mind you, I can say a blue-red deck, that might not be great. But against Sneak and Show, say you've got them locked down, all of a sudden, oops, I'm taking your Emrakul. Against a deck with Termogoyf, I'll take a Termogoyf for one mana. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. So, let's... Uh, now, this deck differs from a lot of the other lists because a lot of the other lists do run Chase. I would say in this current meta, 
unless you're a dedicated control deck or a dedicated like Stoneforge Mystic control deck. You shouldn't be running Stoneforge Mystic, sorry, you shouldn't be running Jace the Mind Sculptor just for value. I think he's really weak just because you have all these tokens in the format and they're going to be able to attack him absolutely no problem unless you're also playing your own tokens, which is usually in a control build with Lingering Souls. So there's a good chance that if you have a Jace out, even plus towing it is not enough for him to stick around. Is that what you're saying? That is what I'm saying. I'm saying there's also a lot of Pyroblast. He might get countered or just destroyed on the field. Cards that uh, are good in this sideboard, though, that we're looking at, Engineered Plague, Ratchet Bomb, Engineered Explosives, Toxic Deluge, these are all good cards. But like I was saying with the Red Build, the Red Build could run Goblin Welder, Dak Faden. You know, you can do a bunch of cool stuff with it, so... Stuff to think about with this deck. I think this deck going into the going into the next um, going into the GP could be a very good list if you've been practicing with it already. If you haven't, I would say stick to something a little bit more conventional. If you haven't, you're also going to be investing a lot of money for a deck you haven't played before because you've got City of Traders, you've got Underground Seas, <laughs> and you could make it more expensive if you do like the uh, Matt Kiefer build is more abysses. So you just keep playing. Like, personally, I think if you're going to play Blue Black Tez, you need to play at least one Abyss in the main, which you could easily do with the list that, um, what's his name? You could Zach totally fit Chains of Mephistopheles into this build. Oh, 100%. Like, <laughs> I don't think, because you're not playing Brainstorm, you don't care. So you could run the Abyss and Chains of Mephistopheles in here. Just no problem. run the entire Black Enchantments Legends package. Nether Void in the board, just for value. <laughs> um, for literal value, not, like, hashtag value. Anyway, <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, there awful. was a Pox deck. I mean, we could talk about Black Enchantments. <laughs> it's true, Pox is a, Pox is a good deck. Except, Pox, well, I don't it's, know if... it's an interesting deck because now they just like treasure cruise out of your lane destruction. That seems terrible. Let's also, talk about... I'm just going to point out that the deck labeled Pox, I apologize for calling it Pox without looking at it, has three Bloodbraid Elf, three Dark Confidant, four Deathrite Shaman, four Abrupt Decay, three Punishing Fire. That's Punishing Junt. Is it in this top 24 list? It, yes, it is playing the card Smallpox. Oh, fuck off. I but didn't even is, see that. That is totally a Jund list that has oh, Smallpox in it. What is that? That was such a tease. I was so excited to talk about that. What the fuck? He's playing a... It, it is a very interesting deck list. Like, not playing a four of Bloodbraid, not playing a four of Dark Confront. Uh, he's got the Maelstrom Pulse in the main. He's got a Xenagos in the main. I'm scrolling. Give me a second. Let me find this. I will send you a direct link. Nope, I want to find it on my own. Okay. No, no, I don't. What the fuck is this abomination? Okay. Oh, it's come on. It's an abomination. Three, I mean... No, I, I'm just calling it that because it's okay. Uh, blood, three Blood Bridal, three Dark Confidant, four Death Ray Shaman, three Bolt, three Punishing Fire, four Abrupt Decay, a Maelstrom Pulse, Himtorok, Smallpox, Thoughtseize, Xenago, Soliana. So now, we've been talking for a while about... I talked about Koth quite a bit. And how Koth is amazing, and you should be playing Koth, and etc. But the Xenagos actually seems like an interesting addition. Well, the Xenagos seems real strong to me because you're probably going to have at least two creatures out by the time that you that you're activating him, and um, the first activation after you've untapped is going to be plus one, add two to three black, uh, two to three red and green mana. Uh, that's free Deathrite Shamans, that's severely discounted Bloodbraid Elf, and when you're paying two for Bloodbraid Elf, that is some serious value. I agree, but you also the 2-2 haste is kind of what you want against, say, like a control deck like Miracles. Like, the reason that I was playing Koth was because you get a 4-4. Four, four. That's pretty insane. You get something Jace can't bounce. Exactly. And that's that's truly critical, but the, the only problem in the Jund deck is you truly only play between three and four mountains, quote-unquote, to actually attack with, so that can be a bit of a problem. So this, you're actually just creating tokens, so even if they sort of plowshares them, you actually don't care, because it's not affecting your mana base anymore. You're like, thanks for the two life, buddy. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just going to dig deeper with my Sylvan library. Uh, so the main thing that we see in this deck that somebody decided to do is still play him to Torok. Now, there's a lot of controversy over whether him to Torok is actually playable now or not, and I'm kind of on the fence, because if you play him to Torok, what's the best result? So nowadays, it's probably him to rock, take both your lands, you get mana screwed, and I kill you. If you hit both their, say, a treasure cruise and something else, that's also pretty good. 
But if you basically hit any other combination of cards, you're just filling their graveyard for treasure crews, which will hopefully get them out of the card disadvantage that they had when they just got hit by that him to draw. I mean, treasure crews is still not a gigantic portion of the meta. I mean, it, it's large, but it's... I think if you're hemming them, and it's only a three of, so you're not like 100% hemming every turn two, I think you have some idea of whether or not him is bad by the time you've cast it. Well, the question is, like, do I want a card that's bad against a lot of the meta? Like, Delver is an increasing part of the meta. I mean, even even then, hemming Delver, those two cards could be really strong. Yeah, they make Treasure Cruise cost two less, but like, if, if you get a young Pyromancer and a Delver, they're not happy about that. Well, either way. I mean, it's still two mana. It's still easily dazable. You'd rather be casting Liliana on turn two? I would rather, personally, yes. Um, but I would rather just cast, say, Inquisition of Kozlek or something like that. Just to specifically grab, I want this card. Now, just to have even more direct, targeted discard? Yeah, because if I can hit, say, I mean, now that's a problem, is Inquisition does not hit Treasure Cruise, fine. I understand. But being able to grab, say, Young Pyro or whatever, that seems fine. Uh, I like that this person is maxed out on Abrupt Decay and, and is almost maxed out on Lightning Bolts. Abrupt now, Decay is a really good card. Yeah, and now with more kind of counters that are coming into the format, like these Delver decks, you want something that's going to get the job done when you want it to. Lightning Bolt puts you out of day's range a little bit easier, obviously. Now, the interesting addition is obviously Smallpox. What do you think about Smallpox, then? I don't know. I have a lot of thoughts. Uh, Good I thoughts think, or bad I, thoughts? I think that Ox is a lot worse off now than it was before, so maybe trying to find a way to play a card like Smallpox is outside of Pox is necessary if you want to play that card. Uh, one advantage I'm seeing here, though, is getting rid of your Confidant or just your token is pretty good. Because if you're getting rid of your Confidant when you're low on life, obviously that's strong. But you activate Xenagos, hit them for two, and then just sacrifice that creature that will be dead anyway. That makes Smallpox a lot less of, a, uh, of an even distribution of pain. I agree. I mean, I really like Smallpox, but I feel like this list would have been great exactly one year ago. Like, roll back the clock, TNN has just released, let's play Smallpox. And we even talked about it. Yeah, uh, I, I do, though. I think Jund is well-positioned right now. Uh, I, I think this deck, is, deck list is a little odd, but uh, I think Jund is in a good place right now. You've I think got a lot of removal for some of the biggest problems in the format. You've got, you're, you're attacking all of the major things that you're worried about, especially if, like this guy, you're running things like chains in the sideboard. Yeah. Now, you just need to be careful. Like, personally, I think Jund is one of the better non-blue decks to be competing in the format. Hands down. Because you have Red Elemental Blast. You have Red Blast, and I think that uh, between Confidant, Bloodbraid Elf, and uh, and Sylvan Library, you've got a lot of the card advantage that you're missing in the other non-blue decks. And a I lot agree. of the other non-blue decks, you're just drawing off the top of your deck one, maybe occasionally two cards a turn. Exactly. Now, the question is, some people have kind of talked about running Chains of Mephistopheles in the main versus, say, Sylvan Library versus whatever. I don't really like Chains in the main. I feel like it doesn't advance your board plan enough, and there are enough decks that don't get hindered by it. That... Do you know we, what have I mean? a, we have a guy who's uh, coming in our group to New Jersey, and uh, luckily we have a very good legacy group where he can play any deck he wants, and he's playing Jund because it's what he's familiar with, and his big decision right now is uh, is how many chains and where the chains are. He thinks, like, the rest of the deck, he's 58 cards, knows exactly what he wants. But it's, do I want chains in the main? If not, do I want Sylvans? If not, do I want something else? I personally think you want Sylvans. Now, I'm not going to toot the horn of Sylvan Library for the 37,000th time, but I feel like if you're going to play Chains of Mephistopheles in the sideboard and Sylvan Library in the main, it could be prudent to instead run Sets of Divining Top. Reasoning being... If you have them both in play at the same time, you can't activate Sylvan Library, which it's just a dead card, but you can if you did have Sensei Divining Top. So it's something to think about. Now, Sylvan Library is better in general because you can actually draw those cards instead of just manipulating them. And because its activation cost is zero. Correct. Because if you look at this mana base, that is not a minor thing. You're only running two basics, and your deck is very much on the high side of expenses as far as legacy goes. Which, I mean, granted, is you have 18 two-drops, 
seven three drops and five four drops but even in legacy that's a pretty high mana curve it is i mean i have had trouble casting blood red elf especially when times. one of the cards you're trying to cast every turn is two mana punishing fire which turns into three mana removal spell so it's something to think about we'll post up lists for like suggested lists or ideas afterwards but it's something to think about with chains of mephistopheles card is really good but the problem is it actually doesn't do anything against that Delver deck where it's like, okay, they still play guys, and even if they get mocked on these cards, they're still producing the tokens. So the change doesn't do anything, or it doesn't do as much as, say, against Omnitel or something like that. It's not as much of a backbreaker, and it's not... The situation is not like Shardless Bug, where you could say, you know, the, the Ancestral Visions is, say, hard casting coming off the stack... Well, I'm going to slide a chains into play, and you know we'll see what happens two turns from now. It's not quite the same, so you kind of have to think about that. I think one to two chains might be fine, but just don't go all in and start running the main. All right. Anything else interesting in this top thirty-two? I have one, but I'm asking you first. <laughs> so we said there was only one elves, which was fine. There's two ad nauseum tendrils, which I'm kind of surprised of, because we don't see a lot of tendrils. Um, you don't see a lot of combo in the last couple months. Even show and tell combo has gone down. Elves has been the main combo deck in the last multiple months. Well, you know why that is. I mean, Miracles has been overperforming, and I mean, you just Miracles is good against combo straight up. Now, notice that Rodrigo Togores, um, his ad nauseum tendrils list. Maybe he was one of the Spanish players who came over from Madrid. Uh, I don't know. It could just be the name. But it would make sense that if he's from Europe, you know, they're more likely to play combo in Europe. Comes across. Uh, oh, Reed Duke made it with Miracles. Cool. I actually didn't see that. Guy is pretty good at Magic the Gathering. He is. I don't know if you know that. Uh, Dig Through Time is uh, seeing some play. I see. Rodrigo, by the way, is indeed from Madrid. I guess that, so I'm pretty good. Well, I googled it. So I know you did. I'm pretty good. Talk to Deluge, seeing a lot more play. Uh, the Charlotte's Bug List is actually running both, wait for it, Ancestral Visions and a Treasure Cruise. I'm quite impressed. I mean, you are filling your graveyard a lot with that deck. I'm a little surprised to see people continuing to want to play Shardless Agent at this point. I don't feel like there's a point. Well, I mean, there are reasons outside of, even if it's not as good as it used to be, it's worth considering that just knowing your deck is better than playing a better deck in most situations. And I'm not saying that that's what happened here, but I would not be surprised if there are many people playing decks that are kind of obviated by Treasure Cruise uh, just because you know how to play it. And that's really, really important in a format like this when you're playing 10 rounds of Legacy and then a top 8. Oh, totally. One thing I noticed... Which, uh, props, by the way, to uh, Eternal Weekend for getting enough people for 10 rounds of Legacy. That's pretty awesome. Star City doesn't get that most of the time. So looking at one one particular um, thought on the metagame is look how many... Like, there's actually quite a bit more Reanimator than we've seen in the last few months as well. Reanimator's real good right now. I mean, we can... I mean, what card really bones them? Let's let's take a look through these uh, to these creatures. Gristlebrand? That's... Eh, Grisbrand's a good card. Tidesville Tyrant, nobody plays that card. Iona's pretty good against, you know, monocolor decks. And oh, look, Elish Norn, Grand Santabite. I really like uh, Reanimator, and I think I've mentioned a couple times I've played it a little bit recently. Just someone literally handed me 75, and it's a lot of fun. I would be concerned that there may be some overreaction to the Delve cards, resulting in a bit more graveyard hate than before. So that would be why I would be hesitant to run Reanimator right now. Uh, that being said, it is extremely strong. I mean, you can mold a four and have a turn one Grizzle Brand. That's very true. Now, I think if you were to play this deck, so, I mean, I'm not trying to give advice to every reanimator player out there, but from my experience, I would want to go faster. So instead of Lotus Petals, I would actually opt for Dark Rituals. Now, it seems a little all-in, uh, but being able to go turn one Ritual and two Mixum is powerful. I'm going to disagree with you, and the main reason is I like Lotus Petal because you can play it not on your combo turn, therefore not fueling their Flusterstorm. I think that's the main reason I like Lotus Petal over a card like Dark Ritual. I mean, that's fair. but My I... other thought was Mental Misstep, but then I forgot we were talking about Legacy. Well, my thoughts on the matter are that you want to go off before, say, Rest in Peace comes down. So I think you probably still want to have the show-and-tell backup package, don't get me wrong, but 
that's that's my i mean ideally rest in peace is coming down turn two anyway um i think maybe the other option would be to bring in some of this sideboard some of these sideboard cards into the main like having one or two abrupt decay in the main board in place of i mean you've got a misdirection in here that could possibly be a removal card he's also playing show and tell in the main looking at uh one of these and that can certainly go into the side uh and i think that's how most people have it configured that i've seen you can have one in the main usually i i know i play one in the main moving on because i don't want to stay here forever uh the lands deck uh john gatz's lands deck so this is i mean we've seen a lot of this as of late it's the punishing fire dark depths list that we're kind of used to seeing he's playing four thespian stage though which is i've I don't seen think, that i mean have you've, you? you've got a lot of really really good targets here I haven't seen that many. That seems quite impressive. One thing I really like about it is you put it into play and you don't use its ability immediately so that you're one of Caracas, you're one of Tabernacle at Pendril Vale. If they wasteland it, you just make a copy of it. That's true. And that's extremely powerful. I've also seen if you're at a point in the game that this is a viable strategy, make a copy of Wasteland or Rashidden Port. Three oh, yeah. or four Rashidden Ports on the board is real hard to deal with. Or even just making a copy of a forest in response to a blood moon or something. Like, that's relevant. So now, let's let's look. How many Tabernacle and Pendril Veils are there in this top uh, 32? More than we've seen, basically, ever. Uh, let's see. There's, there's, I think there's two. Two? I mean, to be fair, the card is like $700. Whether or not the cost of the card is... There's one, two, two. 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 <laughs> There's one in Punishing Maverick and one in Lands. So they're both in Punishing Fire decks. And then they're both in decks that can search for it, which is a big deal. So I think if you own that card and you're really interested in in playing a deck, like you have some experience with either Lands or Maverick, or maybe you want to play Mono White Armageddon stacks. Maybe I feel like you probably... want to just get blown out in the first couple rounds because of bad matchups and then take the train into New York. <laughs> Maybe these are things you want to do. However, the Tabernacle at Pendervale is extremely well positioned right now, and if you have that card sitting in your binder like I do, perhaps this is the tournament to bring it out and crush some fools with it. Yeah, you know, there are people playing it as like a three or four of in the sideboard in Vintage right now. You realize that that's my dream, right? Is to play the most expensive deck in Vintage. Just play like blue, uh, red, black stacks, old school, with three Bazaar, four Workshop, three Tabernacle. And then you play Dark Confidence because you just don't care. Like, I want to live that dream, Sam. You've got strange dreams. I know. Uh, the other thing I found interesting in this uh, <clears throat> in this top 16 was there are six, uh, six Stoneforge Mystic decks. Two of those are Delver decks. But, I don't know, that seems a little low to me. What do you think? It does seem low. It seems like the whole Stoneforge Mystic... Stoneforge Mystic uh, aggro decks have kind of been pushed out of the format by the real aggro decks. Well, and what's also interesting to me is the Stoneforge Mystic decks, there's two of the two of the blue, white, red Delver, and then four Deathblade. No blue, white, no Esper. Yeah, so, I mean, who knows if that's just... I mean, we're, we're hoping that it's actually yeah, just we not... We only a have a very it. small slice of, uh, of what showed up. So, yeah, is Esper Blade just bad is it not competing are people not playing you know say dig through time or whatever we can we can also take notice of the fact that treasure cruise sees a lot of play but dig through time actually didn't like there's uh, you know reduke play two and omnitel is going to be playing it i hope for the love of god if that person i think play. regardless of whether it's better its cost is something that is going to prevent a lot of people from wanting to maybe even test with it at all because for that much mana you're you're heavily invested yeah, only two decks actually play Dig Through Time. And so I, now, Vintage loves this card, don't get me wrong. Now, r real quick, just to rewind like a minute or two, I think the reason Deathblade over Esper is you've got Deathrite Shaman, which is attacking their graveyard. I also think Deathrite Shaman is... If you get Deathrite Shaman just going, in my experience with the Blade decks, if you can keep him alive, he just slowly grinds them out, and there's nothing... You, they just... Oops, I lost. Over the course of 28 turns, I lost because I couldn't direct some damage towards Deathrite Shaman. There are some cards that you can be playing that a lot of people have not looked at. 
that are quite good, or some sideboard I, cards that could perhaps come into the main, so to speak. I I think that you've just described every format in Magic. That's yeah, that's correct. That's why I didn't want to be very specific at all. Um, no, I mean I'm playing a bug uh, bug mid range deck as well. Uh, I'll read out I'll read out some of the list, but not the numbers. We're, again, we're going to post deck lists uh, below the cast. But like for example. The man of- Which means that Matt's going to remember to send me deck lists. This time, yes. <laughs> so this list has Notion Thieves, uh, a card called Abrupt Decay, uh, a card, card Chase the Mind Sculptor, Toxic Deluge, Treasure Cruise, Creeping Tar Pit, and Demir Charm. Now, I know Demir Charm has been talked about, but this card is quite good. And if you're playing blue-black, you may consider playing it as a one-of, because it's got some value in it. Can you go ahead and read Demir Charm? Because I'd imagine most people can't tell you what it does off the top of Of course I will. So now, because these things are all arranged into bullet points, I can very easily read this. Counter target sorcery spell, option one. Option two. Uh, show and tell and miracles. I'm already liking the first uh, mode of this spell. Yes, it counters treasure cruise, it counters show and tell, it counters entreat the angels, terminus, natural order, etc., etc., etc. Envelop for a black extra, but you also have more options. Mode 2. Destroy target creature with power 2 or less. So... Destroy target creature in the blue-red Delver deck. Correct. Uh, destroy anything in the blue-red Delver deck, basically. Uh, you don't get the hit creeping tarpet, which actually happened once and I was very upset. Uh, you also get most of the stuff that's going to be in a Deathblade deck. Deathrite Shaman? Uh, you, you get pretty much stick. everything but Termogoyf in most aggro decks. Yep. You basically get everything the format doesn't have a lot of creatures that are kind of really beefy right now a lot of people aren't playing knight a lot of people aren't playing to, i mean there is still some tarmac in the format but you're killing dark confidence you're killing death rage ones you're killing a lot of things you're killing the creatures that are not big dumb idiots correct now next one not that there's anything wrong with being a big dumb idiot seven damage is a lot i know sam your life must be a struggle uh look at the top three cards of target player's library Put one back and put the rest into that player's graveyard. So this is like Woo Spy, kind of. So you get to look at the top three cards, you get to pitch two into the graveyard, and you get to leave one there. So, I mean, if you yourself are looking for gaps, you know, you get to basically use a top activation, chuck two that are bad, and leave the one on top that you want. Or somebody draws with miracles, and, you know, obviously you could just counter the miracle. Or you could look at the top three in response to the draw trigger, and uh, muck their uh, miracle that's still sitting on top. That's exactly what I was thinking. But I think at that point, why not just counter? I, I suppose maybe they're not going to know what you're doing. Yeah, if you know or... maybe it's not a miracle, maybe they're trying to draw like a force of will, then you could be like, oh, no force. I, th- I think the best thing would be like when they tap out or when they tap top, do it because now they no longer know the arrangement of the top of their library. Yeah, exactly. Like that's which yeah. You know, if you wanted to be like super next level, them you just keep the same card on top. Or what you could do is if the top's on top for some reason after doing those shenanigans, then you just get rid of the top by. Oh my god! Uh, the card is actually it overperforms. Uh, I was quite surprised. I was like, oh, I don't know if this card's gonna be okay. I cut a Tarmogoyf to play Demir Charm. Let's me okay. Let's... Well, I mean, Tarmogoyf is the worst card in. That. Oh come on. It beats for six. Now, I, I also have to point out that in foil, this card is absolutely beautiful. Demir Charm, yeah. It's pretty gorgeous. Uh, Notion Thief, good card as well. You should guys should consider playing that card. That's all. Four mana is a lot of mana. Uh-huh. Tell, tell me about that when you get your treasure crew sniped. I mean, I'm thinking four mana is a lot of mana. I'm like, eh, Jace the Mind Sculptor brainstorms. Notion Thief doesn't make you put them back. This is true. You get to Ancestral Recall on their turn. It's great. Okay. So let's look at the other kind of lists and kind of go over them. So Punishing Maverick. Now, I wish Kobe were on today so we could talk a little bit more about Maverick. But Sam, what do you think about this list? Well, the first and most interesting thing, and I don't know why WotC puts stuff in this order, is it's playing two Domri Raid. That card is being played in a top legacy deck. So I'm going to read this out because, again, I actually didn't know what this card did at all. So it is a one green red Planeswalker. It starts with three loyalty. Plus one is, look at the top card of your library. If it is a creature card, you may reveal it and put it into your hand. Mode. Seems okay. Not bad. So especially in a deck running 21, 22 creatures, you know... And again, very little in the way of uh, card advantage of, of and card selection as well. I agree. 
So minus two. Target creature you control fights another target creature. So you have four Knight of the Reliquary in this deck, which is most of the time going to be decently beefy. We'll say between a 4-4 four, four and a 7-7 seven, seven average. You've also got a scavenging use, so you've got oh. five things that will be probably a 3-3 three, three or larger. So this is pseudo-removal, realistically. Um, usually you're going to fight for either like break-even to break-open kind of what's going on. Like say you have a Ganictique sitting around that's not doing anything and you need to muck their 2-2. Two, two. Well, hey, they fight, and then, oh, you can rumble in. Great. I really like fighting. Uh, as you may know, I'm in love with the card Uvamul's Tracker. So being able to fight is actually quite relevant, and I've played against this exact list, and fighting is no slouch. So also, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of the fight mechanic, um, especially in something like this. I would like it a little more if there were maybe a couple Termoglyphs in here, just because uh, Knight of the Reliquary changes in size too frequently, changes in size negatively too frequently right now. I agree. But for the most part, you're still gonna you're gonna be fighting smaller things. The other thing that this gives you is it gives you removal for flyers. So there you have their Delver of Secrets, you minus two if you just split they lose a Delver and you lose a knight, that's really not that bad. Because they've lost something you can't really do much about. Now you also need to consider the following. Say you attack in with a noble hierarch or Caselli Pride Mage with some exalted. So Caselli Pride Mage suddenly goes from a 2-2 to a 4-4. They don't block. Maybe they have a creature they don't want to lose. For example, Stoneforge Mystic. Now, say there was a creature that could not survive, like your creature could not survive. After the Exalted, after combat, you can always then, second main phase, fight. Exalted is till end of turn. I forgot about that. Yeah. So you just got to remember that you can always get your guy pumped up. Now, remember that Exalted only occurs in the attack phase, so you can't instant speed fight but you can if you have Overwall Tracker. Um, so that could be quite a good strategy if you need to, say, get rid of a creature that they're kind of maybe holding back but slightly too large for you to deal with. Think about it. Swords of Pleasures, Punishing Fires, again, a very uh, robust removal suite. Uh, Swords is basically handling anything, and Punishing Fire is going to grind them out. You have a lot of mana in this deck. Um, you can get even more mana. You can tutor for the Grove itself with Knight of the Reliquary. Voice of Resurgence is kind of the oddball, Sam? Uh, Voice of Resurgence is still a really, really good card, and a lot of decks are going to be playing, you know, probably averaging a third of a, a spell per your turn, like every turn. So you're going to be getting a fair number of elemental tokens off of Voice of Resurgence. I think it's absolutely fine. It's only a one of. He's got the other thing I was going to say is interesting is four green sun zenith. So... If you're playing against a deck that's going to be doing a lot of stuff on your turn, uh, like maybe Miracles, or, you know, if you get matched up against Reset High Tide, uh, <laughs> seems really powerful. As well, this deck seems to be decently positioned against Miracles for a few reasons. Number one, you're running red, so you get to have those blasts. Uh, you're playing Planeswalkers, and you're playing Ganictee, and Punching Fire. Uh, you're forgetting another very major card in this sideboard. I haven't actually looked at the sideboard. I'm just looking at the main deck. Uh, so looking at the... It is playing two Choke. Oh, Choke is an excellent card. <laughs> when, yeah, when you've got them down to, they have uh, two planes that can tap for mana. They're not in a good place. Oh, for sure. I mean, also, Gattic I'm a poster boy for Gattic Teague. Choke, you've got Thrun, Red Elemental Blast, and you have the Punishing Fire combo. It's... Usually this matchup is not very good at all, but this is, this is going to push you into a more favorable position. I I guess I'm still a little concerned with running Knight of the Reliquary as your main beater right now, but this seems to be running a lot more value creatures than in the past. I agree. And another route for Maverick to go is obviously the Dark Depths Hexmage plan and running a junk build. So you get to run, you know, if you want to, Toxic Deluge. You don't even have to run Hexmage. No, of course not. I like... I like running like two Hexmage in that build just because, oh, your Jace is about to pop? Uh, I'm going to pop it for you. Now, pro tip... Running foreign vampire hex mages is the key to true value. It's a 2 1 first strike, and a lot of people actually don't realize that it is a Thalia that, you know, mucks planeswalkers. Card's, card's really good in combat. A lot of people actually just block it without thinking that it has first strike. So, you know, you gotta get your value where you can. Scumbag. <laughs> Read the cards. Oh, you can't? Call a judge. Yeah, well, this would be in the uh, how do you prepare for a large event? Call a judge. Always call a judge. If you think maybe you should call a judge, then you should have called a judge 20 seconds ago. That's correct. 
So, um, I don't want to go over every single deck in here, but I mean... He said 45 minutes into recording. (laughs) I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm making a lot of fun of you. I know, it's okay. It's because you're insecure about yourself. Um, I am. So, let's let's kind of break down what the common themes are in this uh, top 32 here. Delver is quite popular. Delver with cantrips. In fact, if you're playing that deck, I will give you a high five if you register your deck as cantrip delver. So how do we combat the cantrip delver deck? Well, reasonably, you can shut off their cantrips, or you can just kill all of their weak-ass creatures. It's hard. They do have quite a bit of pressure, and the deck is quite fast. If you are playing Abrupt Decay, you're in a good spot. Killing their delver and just being able to kill their stuff unconditionally is very important. You could also be playing cards like Pyroplasm. You could be playing um, Rough Tumble. You could be playing Engineer Explosives. You could be playing Golgari Charm. You could be playing Zealous Persecution. You can be playing Toxic Deluge. Supreme Verdict. There's, there's a lot of options. I think the big thing right now, and uh, you and I discussed this a little bit when we were talking about my deck yesterday, is um, a lot of those cards have been sideboard cards in the past, and I think it's not unreasonable to maybe have if you're running two of them, maybe have one of them in the main board. Because a lot of those cards still do a lot of work in most matchups. Like, even a card like Zealous Persecution. Sure, maybe it didn't kill all their dudes. But maybe it made a block a lot more favorable for you. Or maybe you just use the plus one, plus one to just kill them. Oh, exactly. I think that's I think that's a, a major change worth considering. Yeah. Maelstrom Pulse is another card that we saw, like, it made a really big splash in Vintage. I mean... But on the subject of Maelstrom Pulse, if you're playing the best color in Legacy, Echoing Truth does the exact same thing for one CMC less. Okay, well, let's not talk about that. You don't like Echoing Truth? I don't know. I think it's okay. I would rather be able to kill Jace as well for one extra mana. Uh, Another card, and I don't think this is something to consider in Legacy unless you're playing a deck that's heavily red. Electricery. Card is super, super good against a bunch of Pyromancer tokens. Oh, I love that card. Electricery is amazing. Gets misstepped in Vintage, though, which is sad. Yeah. Another card, Engineered Plague. If you're worried about your young Pyromancer tokens, if you're worried about... Shit. Blank. If you're worried about uh, True Nemesis still, which you shouldn't be, because we didn't see that many of them, you can choose that. Good card all around. Tabernacle of Pendril Veil. All good cards. Um, speaking of Engineered, uh, Explosives. Yes. Didn't, uh, didn't mention that. Ratchet Bomb. These are all token... This is all stuff that's going to take out Delver slash tokens. Um, elves would might not be the best choice to be playing at this uh, at this GP. Yeah, there, there will be a lot of people playing these cards that we just named. Not and to mention you Terminus. Terminus. When you do something like like I'm saying like Zealous Persecution, in the main deck, and you're just like, um, I'll wipe your board at the end of turn. That seems fine. They're going to be a little bit sad about that. Definitely quite sad, actually. <laughs> so the next deck. I mean, that you need to watch out for his Miracles, the big boogeyman that's the best performing deck in the format by far. So how are you combating Miracles, Sam? <sighs> Haven't we talked about this like eight times? Oh, we have. Mir- miracles is just so strong. Um, you need a Consortium of Hate. Yeah, you need a lot of different things. You need a Legion of Doom, as it were. <laughs> um, punishing high mana cost cards is a very good way to start. So things like Gaddic Teague. Sorry, did you say Gaddic Teague? Cost more. I did say Gaddic Teague. Um, making cards cost more can help a lot when you make their, uh, like, Athalia. When Athalia makes an Entreat the Angels produce one less angel, that's four less damage on the battlefield. Um, and now I'm starting to go towards Junk and Maverick, which I know is very strange for me. Uh, I like Flusterstorm. I don't know if it's main deckable anymore, but Flusterstorm is frequently a problem for Miracles because, you know, you get into a fight, they've spent their mana, and then you Flusterstorm. Uh, any of the sphere effects as well are quite good, so if I mean, if you decide to get into the Trinosphere... We are not running white stacks. <laughs> I'm just suggesting cards that they could play. Stop. If you own four motes, though, you should play white stacks. So you could play, be playing Trinosphere, Sphere of Resistance, Lodestone Golem. If you wanted to go down the mud route, I think this could be one of the better tournaments to do it in. I don't suggest it because the the deck is wildly inconsistent, but making all the Delver cantrips cost more through either Thalia or Sphere of Resistance or whatever is not bad. Making Jace cost five is not bad. Uh, Pithing Needle is still a good card. Uh, and Engineered Explosive still does work against the Angel Tokens because you can just set it on zero, set it and forget it, like the rotisserie thing on the shopping channel. 
Uh, that's uh, is that that's a Ron Popeil in It is. Oh, what is that called? Set it. Oh, I can't think of. I can't think of what it's called. We should have that as the outro music. No. <laughs> no. Uh, if if we're gonna put ads on here, I want to actually make money off of them. <laughs> I. That's probably true. Um, okay, so we know how to do miracles. We've been talking about miracles. Miracles has not changed much. Some people might be running big through time, but to be honest, the deck list is already very tight as is. Most people won't make any changes. Yeah, which I think is actually another thing you can exploit is maybe running more of these delve cards than usual simply because counterbalance can't counter them. That is correct. Many people are not running Tombstalkers just to counter Treasure Cruise. It's, um, it's very important to note that. Omnitel, I think, is if you're. I don't think. I think Omnitel is very well uh, positioned, but it's got all the usual combo weaknesses, and every single card in it is countered by Red Blast. Yeah. So, again, what card can you play? Pyroblast, Red Blast, all good cards. Can't go wrong. Anything that hates on draw, anything that hates on combo. Um, I think right now the deck is really, really well positioned, but we're in a format where Red Blast is arguably main deckable which could end up being a problem for that deck. I agree. So moving on to another kind of set of decks, like a Deathblade, Esperblade kind of lists. If you're looking to hate on them, as we talked about in the first year of our cast, what card did uh, shits all over this deck? Would it be Blood Moon? Blood Moon is really good against a, a large portion of the format. Spe- like the Deathblade decks are a really good example of it. Uh, Canadian Threshold, it tends to be really, really punishing too. I love it. Um... I'm running cards in my sideboard specifically for Blood Moon. So what deck runs Blood Moons in the main and Blasts? That would be Painter. Painter, or, uh, as we saw at Star City, Minnesota, Mono Red Mog Hatcher. Which I basically call Dragon Stompy, because that's... It's Dragon Stompy with Goblins, but yeah. So you guys should consider that as well. Uh, Reanimator, I wouldn't worry too much about. If you're not packing a few pieces of Graveyard Hate in an Eternal sideboard... I think you're doing it wrong anyway. You're rolling the dice. You take your shot and say, I hope to not hit that dredge deck today or that reanimator deck. Well, I will admit I will be doing that with mud, probably. Well, that's okay. Because based on my brief playtesting with what I think is my 75, mud is really rough. Yeah, so it seems like that's how you kind of hate on a lot of the uh, a lot of the strategies here. There's a lot of, just note, there's a lot of Delver in the format. And no matter how many cards that they draw, their creatures are still garbage. They're absolute trash. They're not very good at all. They only have so many counter spells. so if you have some sort of engine like Punishing Fire or just more removal than they do, you can just outgrind them. You want to take the game out of their hands in the first three turns, survive, and take it towards, you know, turn five, six, seven, eight. All right, so because we talked about that for literally ever, let's quickly move on to SCG Minnesota. So, Minnesota results in order are... Patriot Delver, a.k.a. Cruise in USA, which this is what they should be calling this deck, not Jeskai Guy Delver. What the fuck? Awful. That's right. Look look at TC decks, because they usually go off what the person actually called oh, the deck. Oh, thank God. And when you get to the 12th place deck, I'm just going to do a little dance in my chair. Okay, I'm waiting for the dance. Oh, actually, can you turn on the... Please, please turn on your webcam so I can see this dance. Uh, I'm not wearing pants right now. Okay, then no. Please don't. <laughs> so we have uh, Cruise in USA in first. Miracles in second, 43 lands in third, Slivers... Wait, how many lands is this uh, land stack running? I don't know, it's probably like 37 or something. It's 35, don't call it 43 lands. It, the deck is still 43 <laughs> lands in my heart since 2007. That's when I played Mulch, that's the deck for me. Um, Slivers came in fourth, so meat we'll talk hooks. about that. Yes, that is the Meat Hooks deck. Uh, Blue Red Delver, straight from 2011, comes in fifth place. Storm in sixth place, Reanimator in seventh. Blue Red Delver in 8th, flipping the page, you see Cruise in USA in ninth, Dredge in 10th, Omnitel 11th, uh, Counterbalance 12th, Mono Red Moncatcher, which is the, which is the uh, Dragon Stompy list, in 13th, another Blue Red Delver in 14th, Imperial Painter in 15th, and 16th we get Shardless Bug, not Sultai. Uh, the rest of the list finishes up with uh, the famous people, apparently, or something. Steak and Show, Blue Red Delver, and Soldiers, who came in 115th. That is usually uh, the ones that are random other places are people who were featured in deck techs. So they've oh, okay. already got the deck list. They don't have to type it up a second time. Cool. Perfect. Um, I want to talk about a couple of these decks because they're really cool. We'll go through them really quickly. Uh, first off, Slivers. Yeah. This deck is playing four of an M14 common. 
this deck is really, really cool. Um, I'm not going to say it's a really great deck, but it is really cool. <laughs> any, any thoughts on Slivers, Matt? Well, I think that he should be playing four Muscle Sliver and three Predatory Sliver, because Muscle Sliver comes from, like, what, Tempest? And just looks way better, and does come in Korean. So there, he's playing the Wing Sliver and the Gale Rider Sliver. Now, we've talked about this before. This is kind of the, uh, this is the 3-3 the Sarah Avenger issue. Why is Sarah Avenger so good in Death and Taxes? It fucking flies. Evasion is a real ability that people really take for granted in Legacy currently horsemanship, whatever. Like, having all of these guys fly means that all those Tarmogoyfs on the ground are not doing anything. You're missing, I think, another very, very major card on the creature side of this deck, which is Crystalline Sliver. Oh, no, no, I was getting to Crystalline okay. Sliver, too. But flying is very important for actually getting through damage. Now, obviously, Crystalline Sliver is amazing just because of the fact of, well, having them all gain Shroud is pretty darn great. I mean, no removal spell hits any of your guys, like... He oh. also protects himself, right? That's the whole thing. Only it's not sweepers like, work. Yeah. So it's not a situation of, oh, um, like a lord kind of effect of like all my other guys. So you can kind of break through similar to a, um, like the enchantress card, the green, uh, the green white enchantment. That keeps your, uh, gives all your enchantments shroud. Except itself, right? Oh, fuck. I can't remember right now. But uh, point being, as soon as crystal and silver comes down, which can easily be off of an Aether Vial on 2 in response to a, you know, Swords of Plowshares, suddenly everything grains Shroud. And unless your opponent is playing, say, Ming Deck Toxic Deluge, which gets increasingly more difficult for them to play as your creatures get beefier and beefier, you know, I mean, he's got he's got 12 Pump Slivers. Like, look, like, almost 12. He's got 11. Like, that's, that's pretty insane. Like, this is getting on the level of Lord status, right? Like... And I love that you get to run, like, Harmonic Sliver in this sideboard, and it's uncounterable, and you can do it with Ether Vial if you want to. I mean, and you got to remember, like, a lot of people seem to forget, like, all sl- as soon as Harmonic Sliver's in play, every Sliver after that is a Disenchant. Every Sliver after that is whatever. Like, ugh. Now, Dark Heart, like, I'm, this is, this is five-color Sliver, basically. I mean, sorry, four-color Sliver. The mana base is a little bit... Mm, shall we say bad well, when you run um, four caverns that's made a lot easier though yes it is i feel like you should actually just run ancient ziggurat like i know there's like an underground scene a tundra and a trop and i just why you want fetch lands i understand for brainstorm don't get me wrong and you want fetch targets for brainstorm and then you're out of land slots i feel like sliver hive is like i guess it's slightly better than ziggurat in that you get to make tokens maybe sometimes once in a while fine I just feel like there could be room for Ziggurat in these, like, mini-color, say, Hate Bears or Slippers or whatever. Overall, I really like this list. Now, should you expect to see this deck at the GP? Mm, probably Okay, not. I've got a reason why Sliver Hive is better than Ancient Ziggurat. What does Ancient Ziggurat say? Ancient Ziggurat says, Tap, add one mana of any color to your mana pool, spend this mana only to cast a creature spell. Sliver Hive does, cast for, does tap for colorless for non-creature spells. I thought it had the same ability as it. No, it's color. tap, tap, add one to your mana pool, or tap, add one mana of any color that can only be spent on slivers. That's, That's the reason fair. you're playing Sliver Hive is to uh, to have colorless in addition to mana for your slivers. That's fair. All right. So, what is this deck bad against? Uh, well, you know the usual terminus, toxic deluge, things that punish bad mana bases. Yeah. So, I mean, Blood Moon is still going to absolutely annihilate this deck. Uh, turning off Aether Vi- turning off Aether Vial also prevents a lot of shenanigans. A uh, really good card against this deck, Spell Snare. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. They are running four caverns and four Aether Vials. Oh, they should I not know. be allowing their uh, their cards to be snared. I'm just saying. Man, I really want to just order this entire deck right now. I think if you don't have any experience with this deck, there are a lot better decks out. Like I well, still no. think Elves is probably a better deck. I mean, like to play the day after New Jersey. I'm not gonna play the deck until then. <laughs> Fair enough. I just think this this is this definitely seems like the kind of deck that would be a lot of fun to play. I would not make any this meta game. Weekly. I would not like, make any meta game decisions based on this deck, though. Please, dear God, no. Uh, the next deck I think I want to talk about, unless you have any last thoughts on the Slivers deck. You want to talk about Blue Red Painter? Talk about Blue Red Painter. All right. So, like, quite literally, this deck has been transported. I looked at my list from 2011 that my friend was playing and borrowing cards for me. That's why. This is transported straight out of 2011. 
This deck is three and a half years old. I think the evidence for that, I believe the newest card in this deck list is from New Phyrexia. Yeah, it is. The newest card in this deck list is from New Phyrexia. Now, this almost the exact same list is, again, what was played at Providence. GP Providence. There's nothing wrong with this deck. I've played this deck a lot. I just think that playing Blood Moon is better. This is a more combo-y get-you kind of uh, painter deck, which is fine. It's a little bit faster. You can use Lion's Eye Time to, like, activate on, you know. You get a lot of, like, oops, I win turns. But I think, in general, just you just want to play Blood Moon. You just want to play Blasts. Like, three Blasts is not enough. So you think, uh, w what is the order of strength? Is it red followed by Strawberry Shortcake followed by Blue Red? Correct. Now, some are going to argue that Strawberry Shortcake is better because you have two to resent. I think the consistency is key. Like, I think you just want to play mono red. You just want to jam your guys, and you just want to be consistent. You just because most of the time you're actually not winning on like turn two with painter. You're grinding them out. How do you grind them out? As many blood moon effects as you possibly can is very good in legacy. So I mean, I think mono red is probably slightly better in general than strawberry shortcake, which is the uh, the red white splash, which is essentially red and enlightened tutor. Enlightened Tutor, and some people have decided to play Stoneforge Mystic. That seems fine to me. Um, all right, can we talk about the deck you know I really want to talk about? You can talk about the deck you really want to talk about. This deck is labeled Rest in Pieces on TC decks. Um, I'm not. I'm going to run through it really, really quick. One True Name, three Days, four Brainstorm, four Enlightened Tutor, four Force, one Terminus, one Detention Sphere, one Humility, one Luminarch Ascension, three Counterbalance, three Energy Field, four Rest in Peace, one Ensnaring Bridge, one Helm, one Pithing Needle, one Vidalcan Shackles, four Top, 22 Lands. This is not far off of what I played at the GP last year. <laughs> is that a good or a bad thing? Both. A, a deck so like this is a lot of fun to play if you're not playing against it. It's just chock full of weaknesses, but it is really cool. So now the question is, why would you play Days in a control deck? Why would you play one of Trunet Nemesis? I suppose the Days is probably for the the super early plays. So it's probably for Delvers, Swift Spears, uh, maybe Pyromancers. And I would guess that the True Name Nemesis is just a big dumb idiot. It's to, when you don't have one of your combos out, to just block. And if you have Luminarch Ascension and they only have one dude, they're not going to do any damage. True. What... What card is really missing here that you can notice? I just want to see if you notice it, that it's not here. I did not look at this super heavily. Um, what uh, what card would you say? Um, it's missing, like, three Terminus. I know that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the other one mana one? Sword Supplashers. There's actually no Sword Supplashers in I, this list. I suppose he's just so heavily on um, Rip, en Rip Energy Field. I don't actually, know. Like, I, think, I don't think... I think the bigger thing that's missing here is misdirection because the biggest problem this deck had in my experience because i ran a deck very similar to this for almost a year is that they abrupt decay and there's nothing you can do about it and then they've got 28 dudes on the field and you just lose yeah i think you can cut things like detention sphere i think you can cut the main deck pithing needle i don't think it's really necessary i would cut dazes just for removal i mean a four in line two deck i, I is... might cut dazes just for spell pierces yeah, okay, you could argue that, but mid, like that could also be your misdirection slot and whatever. Point being, I think this deck could be quite powerful right now. Like, even though a year has gone by, I mean, let's look at what's good against what. I mean, Rest in Peace is good against Treasure Cruise. Um, Rest in Peace is good against the entire format. Energy Field actually cannot be removed from the field by um, stupid Blue Red Delver. They can't do anything against that card. They actually have no out except if they have a Pyroblast main deck or sideboard. Oh, let me real quick read this sideboard. One Chalice, one Needle, one Aethersworn Canonist, one Back to Basics, one Dissension Sphere, three Greater Auromancy, three Leyline of Sanctity, one Moat, one Porphyry Nodes, one Aegis of the Gods, and one Daze. I want to so high-five this person so badly. So let me read Greater Auromancy. So it is a, it's the same cost as Rest in Peace, but other enchantments you control have Shroud and enchanted creatures you control have Shroud. So, point being... So I guess that's your misdirection. Yeah, that's essentially your all my things now have shroud. So, try to break this up. You only have four abrupt decades. Have fun. Now, I also like Videlkin Shackles. Like, 
That card brings back so many memories. That's a card I think could be played in Miracles, just in general. It's a little bit slow, but I like it. So, could this deck, is this deck playable? 100% yes, this deck is 100% playable. This is, this like, having I mean, a rest in peace? It's, it got 12th in a 247-person tournament. It's obviously okay, at the very least. Now, I mean, if you have no experience with Miracles, again, I wouldn't suggest trying it now. But, I mean, if you have some experience, you should probably play around with the Energy Field deck, because uh, you'll be surprised how you can just pull out some free wins, because some people just can't break up Energy Field. Uh, rest in peace. The only thing I would suggest is in the mana base, just maybe running one Academy Ruins just for the value in case they kill your Helm of Obedience or something crazy happens. Yeah, so. if, you want, if you want to go to real value town, I played this deck for a little while with one Volcanic and one Tropical Island just for my Engineered Explosives. I've done that in the past as well. It's pretty, pretty And then pretty as great. soon as I got my first uh, Underground Sea, I had to cut that trap. Well, because then you could just play the Thopter Foundries. Let's uh, let's move on to the Mod Catcher deck, which I'm not going to refer to it as Mod Catcher anymore. Okay, just so we're clear, it's going to be Dragon Stompy. This is it's a take a Stompy deck, put in Mod Catcher, which goes and gets a Goblin, put in Goblin Rabble Master, which in every format it's legal in is absolutely insane. There you go. That's the entire deck list. Yeah. So a lot of the times in the Dragon Stompy list, you had bad creatures. Straight up. There was, there was a terrible creature suite, so you had, like, you had... Speaking of creatures, sorry. can we point out there are zero dragons in this Dragon Stompy list? Correct, but it's just a name. Deckless it's naming conventions in Eternal formats are fun. Point being, you had really bad creatures. There was the Pit Dragon. Um, you had um, Arc Slogger. Just, again, all the creatures were just terrible. I mean, nowadays you have a Rakamar, which puts in 3-1 haste tokens into play. Like, that's not bad at all. Kikijiki, uh, Tuk Tuk, uh, Scrapper, Simeon Spirit Guide, Siege Gang Commander, Murderous Redcap, uh, Mog Catcher to go find your stuff, and it also, like, Nemesis. Ooh, Jap Foil Nemesis. That's going to look fun. Um, Magus the Moon, and Rabble Master. Rabble Master is, like Sam said, just an insane card. My, my biggest problem with Rabble Master is... Um... I want to play it. I do not want to pay what a Goblin Marvel Master costs, which is only like $15 in paper, but that's way too much for a rare and standard for me. So let's see what happens. Like if you, let's, let's think about this. So it's conceivable that you go turn one Rabble Master. So let's kind of do a damage. Let's do a take on the damage here. So you play turn one Rabble Master, you pass. Um, so at the beginning of the combat, of combat on your turn, you can put a token into play. So on turn one, you're going to put a token into play, and it's going to attack for one. It's going to attack for two because... Oh, I'm sorry. Goblin oh, Rabble Master doesn't turn attack. Fable. Sorry. Yeah. No, I Assuming you attack with Rabble Master, you're going to attack with a 2-2 Rabble Master and a 2-1 Goblin Token. The next turn, you're going to attack with a 2-2 Goblin Rabble Master and two 2-1 Goblin Tokens. Yeah, so you're going from four damage to six damage. It, it's, it's very good. Point being, it's hard to kill. Well, I mean, it's not hard to kill, but I mean, you still have to, you still will have produced tokens. Yeah, that that is definitely a kill on sight. Now, again, you've also got this. You've got eight moon effects that you can play on turn one in this deck. You have Trinospheres to help lock them down. You have Chalice of the Void, and again, if if your cards come together in the correct order, this deck is going to be extremely powerful. But unfortunately, that's probably not what happens. Now, if we'll notice, there's actually a really interesting card in the sideboard that a lot of people have forgotten about. Goblin Sharpshooter. Goblin Sharpshooter can gun down mm, quite a bit of stuff. Um, against the blue-red deck, you can actually gun down their entire team, except their... Um... Except for Swift Spear. Yeah. Swift Spear and Flip Delver is the only thing Goblin Sharpshooter does not immediately kill. And it also gets to gun them down all in the same turn. So, think about that. Playing Anarchy, that's neat. Well, I guess you want to get rid of stuff like Moat. It's probably and... for Death and Taxes, honestly. Um, that could be it. Too. And he's also doing the Singleton Emrakul on the sideboard for the uh, painter for the painter matchup. I like that. That's pretty techy. So I do want to talk about um, not to downplay the achievement of these players, but when you run a tournament relatively close to an event like Eternal Weekend, you're gonna miss out on a lot of players. So some of these odd deck choices in the top sixteen of Star City, Minnesota or Minneapolis may just be that. The players who were playing more commonly known decks went to Eternal Weekend. No, I agree. It's it's tough. Like 
again, not to downplay the achievement, but it's possible that a lot of the more professional players did in fact go to Eternal Weekend, and perhaps the meta was a little soft to these, say, Tier 1.5, Tier 2 decks that managed to penetrate their way through the tournament. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you have to take that into account if you're thinking about picking up one of these decks for the upcoming GP. Or if you're thinking about uh, making metagame decisions based on them as well. Yeah. So, reasonably, you do not have to worry about facing Slivers, Painter, Mog Catcher, whatever. Worry about the main players. So, what decks do you need to actually watch out for? Again, Blue Red Delver is going to be very popular. Miracles is going to be very popular. All of the pay all of the Delver variants are going to be more popular than they were, say, if you played in an event four months ago. So, keeping that in mind, you know what you need to do. And is there anything else to talk about? Oh, oh, I, I have a play of the week. How about a misplay of the week? That's that's okay. I oh, I do have a play of the week, actually. I played, So you go first. I told you about this last night, but I played against a guy playing Slivers in the Vintage 2-man queue on Moto today, or last night, and um, I narrowly squeaked out game one. Yeah. Game two, I lost to misunderstanding how Poisonous works, which, just so everyone knows, Poisonous and Infect, not the same. And then game three, he just overwhelmed me with dudes. But I was talking to some of my friends, like, wait, really? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm playing Power. He's playing 35 and 15 commons. It was, it was cool. It was fun to play against a deck like that. And it really shows how uh, most of the strongest decks in every format are very, very heavily metagamed. So when something like that, that is arguably a much weaker deck, comes along, sometimes you're just not ready for them. And we could, talk, we could talk for 30 minutes about the importance of buys, but if you don't have buys to New Jersey and you have the possibility of getting them between now and then, I would definitely go for it because that's the kind of deck you tend to not have to play against if you have buys. Because, again, not to uh, downplay those players, but in general, those decks aren't going super deep in the winner uh, uh, bracket. Yeah, generally they can't actually compete with the objectively more powerful level of the format. So, yeah. Um, my play of the week that I thought was really great was I was playing on Cockatrice with uh, with Nickfit, which I think is another deck because it just goes over Delver. And Miracles can't counterbalance anything. It's It could be a good deck. Containment Priest is not going to see a lot of play, at least right now. So I think you could be playing Nickfit and doing quite well. Point being. I'm sure we'll get into Containment Priest in our next cast. We'll review some Commander product a little bit. So I'm playing Nick Fit. He's on Blue Red Delver. He's got a kind of a good start. Uh, I play for Nisha Dean and wipe the board, and he starts to come back. So I have uh, Birthing Pod in play, but no creatures. But I managed to rip Kitchen Finks. So I play Kitchen Finks, pod it away, so I've gained two life, comes back into play, gain another two life. So I'm up four. I pod into Siege Rhino. Siege Rhino drains him for three, I gain three. So I'm up seven so far this turn, and I have a 2-1 as well as a 4-5 Trampler. Suffice to say, he has no removal for Siege Rhino, and uh, the game is over mm, quite quickly. Siege Rhino is, ver- is a very good card. The problem is, obviously, four mana, and he's just dumb. He doesn't. He still bites the Sword Splashers. But that's the only removal he actually gets hit by. Now, we were talking about, oh, if he's only half the mana less, he'd be playable. I actually think he might be just straight up playable he's just going over the top you're also though playing it in a very a deck that's got a ton of mana of course but i'm saying i think there's a possibility that maybe he fits into a deck that's not nick fit he is quite good i can see why people are playing it in standard and in modern i mean maybe the format is a little bit too fast right now but you know given some acceleration or what have you four or five trampler that drains for three is Nothing to sneeze at. Like, consider it. Yeah. That's, uh, that's all I've got. I think we've got... Um, the only other thing I want to mention, this will be our last published cast before New Jersey. Um, if you're going, good luck. If you want to meet up with me, tweet at me at the Craven one or look for me on the pairing boards. I will be attempting to bring recording equipment, so if anyone wants to sit down and talk for a few minutes, that would be totally cool. Um, yeah. Oh, Matt, did I tell you what I'm going to be doing for New Jersey? No. I'm ordering a bunch of Eternal Warriors to have just random people sign. Nice. Or were they like a quarter or something? Yeah, they're like 25 cents, and I think that's a that's a good card to have Legacy players sign. Let me see what the art is. Hold on. Eternal Warrior. 
It's like a samurai oh, dude from the side. Enchanted creature has vigilance. Yeah, I know this one. Oh, terrible card. But um, yeah, good luck to everybody out there. And uh, test, test, test. Make sure you know your deck inside and out. Metagame your sideboard choices based on these last couple of tournaments. And if you have interesting tech, play it. Get a friend to read your deck list, and then get another friend to read your deck list, and make sure it is correct. And do not audible the night before, please. That's, I am actually, on purpose, not bringing any cards other than the decks I'm playing to prevent myself from audibling. Which, of course, will probably just result in like a $700 charge on my Visa when I audible, but you know. Also, make sure, please, for the love of God, watch your stuff. Don't bring more product than you need to. Keep an eye on your things. And be vigilant about cheating if you can. They've been getting better about security, and it's a Star City event, and so I, I imagine there won't be any problems, but... Well, there's is... still possibly between five and 6,000 people. You know, pro like, realistically, it's going to be somewhere between two and 6,000 people. Um, That's so not a giant range. I know, but conservatively 2,000, more likely from what it's been looking like, five to 6,000. Oh, yeah, uh, if anyone wants to split a $50 cab with me from Newark, I land at 1235 on Friday, and I really don't want to pay for that cab. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair so guys make sure and girls make sure you you know watch your stuff and it, like i said like sam was saying if in doubt call a judge if you're unsure about how many land drops have been made if you're unsure what your opponent is doing or what a card does or anything any questions at all what do you do sam always call a judge and don't worry about wasting judges time or anything like that it has now been confirmed this will be the largest judge staff at any event ever so there will be more than enough judges that would be happy to answer your questions or watch your opponent for cheating or slow play or whatever. If your opponent is not playing at a reasonable pace and they look like they are tanking all the time and stalling, call the judge. Or obviously first ask them, hey, can you please speed up? You know, we need, you know, legacy is an intricate form and, you know, whatever excuse you need to say, basically hurry the fuck up. But if in doubt, call a judge. Well, I think that's about it for us, yeah? Yeah, I think that's good, so I think we're going to end now. Feedback is always appreciated. Email us at everydayeternalcast at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash everydayeternalpodcast. Or follow us on Twitter at eternalmpg.